Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Last week we began a series which I call Sanctification of the Family. Last week was part one, why we need it. And we talked about it. We talked about what the curse did to the family. But what I want to progress from here is I want us to try to picture as we start on part two on the husband. I want us to remember that when God created at first, the first place he created was his sanctuary, Eden. To the east of that, he did that before he did the other things, the area of work, the area of service. He created Adam in that area of work. And then God did something miraculous. He placed him in the garden. He didn't pick him up. He, he drew him. He wooed him into the garden. And from there, God established what he wanted, which was a relationship with man. Man was placed in the garden to work and protect that garden. And we know that his work was not laborious. I mean, it was pure joy. His work was to grow in knowledge and faith and grace in God. To walk with him. To protect it from anything coming in. But God had a purpose and a plan. He wanted man to have dominion and to multiply. He wanted others like him, holy people, to go out and fill the world. But Adam, it was not good for Adam to be alone because he couldn't do that on his own. So we had the relationship with God and man where man was going to worship and grow and know the ways of God. I was talking to David Spears on Saturday or on Friday and he was telling me he's doing sermon on the attributes of God. And he's building it on this verse where Moses asked God to let me see your glory. And he said, I've studied it and you, no man can look on the glory of God and live. But what he said was, what Moses was saying is, Lord, let me know your ways. Let me know you. Let me know your ways. And I looked at that and pondered. I said, you know what? That's amazing because Moses was asking for something that Adam had before the fall. Adam knew God. He walked with him. God walked with him. He established that relationship. And then God did something miraculous. In order for him to fulfill the command, he put Adam into a deep sleep and took from him a rib and shaped a woman. It wasn't just the fact that he shaped her from him. It was God loves him equally, and we talked about the different roles. But when God created Eve, he presented her to Adam like a father would give his daughter away in marriage. He gave her as his wife. And we know what happened the fall. And now Adam was going to be laboriously working against a world that was cursed. He was now going to have to sweat. Now the time he would have been spending learning more and more about God was going to be divided with working. The relationship between man and woman. The relationship between woman and man and woman and her children has before ever been distorted. And we're going to look at today the husband, and next week we'll look at the woman. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and for this study. And Lord, we need your insight and wisdom because we're fallen. We strive and strive, and sometimes our striving to be good husbands makes us God. And we forget that the most important, most important object in our life is to get to know you. To have a relationship with you and have a relationship with our wife. Bless us, teach us, conform us to the image of your son. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we begin to look on how sanctification looks within the family, we need to be reminded that this interaction within the family is an iron sharpening iron process. 
You think you sharpen iron with the guy that cuts you off on the road. You think you sharpen iron with the people that you work. It is your family that is really going to sharpen you. We will encounter different circumstances where personal feelings and emotions, wounds and hurts will be experienced. And as a result of the fall, our struggle with sin, pride, ego will manifest itself and cause harm to relationships within the family. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. If you've grown up in a Christian home all your life, you probably would not have endured a lot for those of us who never grew up in a Christian family and married and became Christians later. And that's this. When you enter into a marriage, you bring baggage. You bring your own baggage. I think if you sat down and look at your relationship with your spouse, husbands, when you look at your wives... Half the fight you have with your wife isn't because of your wife. It's because of what you brought into the marriage that you haven't forgiven and resolved from the family. As a matter of fact, if you probably sat down and said, since I've been married, what is the one thing my wife has done that really irritated me? You'd probably find out it's less than what you think, other than her saying, you were wrong, you need to do stuff. We come in with those wounds and hurts. If you're an unbeliever and you come into a marriage, it's tough. It's tough. If you've been in a background, a situation where you've been abused, you've been hurt, and now you're married, you don't trust. You don't trust. Those are the natural things in. But even as a Christian husband, as a Christian father, which we'll learn, if we do not remember that our number one priority as a husband as a spiritual leader is to follow God to follow Christ we can't let our work outside of the home deprive us of our most important thing let me let me tell you something you can become the president of the CEO and get all the accolades in the world and lose your family and be disobedient to God because you made your work your God and not God and did not keep the word of him loving your loving him and then loving your wife this is a priority but as we begin it's at that time when we're hurting that we must remember what Paul wrote in uh, Ephesians 5 20 and 21 Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Here we go. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That word be subject to is to subordinate, to subjoin. When you're, ma when you're married husband, she is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. The two of you are one. The two of you are one. But it says to be subject in the fear of Christ, in fear, awe-inspiring reverence. That word reverence means deep, profound love and respect, both in attitude and behavior. This is something, men, we can't do on our own. It is deep, it is spiritual, and it comes from within. Our relationship with our wives is a reflection of our relationship with God. If we have not had time for the Lord and we treat everything else more important, then everything else will be treated more important than our wives. We will put everything over our wives because everything has over, surpassed where God should have been. The Apostle Peter also wrote in 1 Peter 3, 7 and 8, You husbands... That's pretty direct. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Listen, so that your prayers will not be hindered. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Now, that verse 7 in an understanding way basically gnosis, knowledge. 
What is known, what has come to known, and as you grow in your, with, with your marriage with your wife, and as you grow in the Lord, the Lord will bring to you a different understanding of your wife. He will show you ways to love her, to honor her, to care for her. A man that cannot love, honor, and care for his wife is only a man in the, in the secular sense. Anybody can be strong, physical, and dominating. But it really takes a man who has a heart for God, who has compassion, empathy, and can love and care for his wife more than he cares for her. More than he cares for her. With someone weaker, a person understood as a vessel to be filled. Now, if you remember last week, I said that the woman that God made is the foundation of the household. It's her. When you come home and your children are, are courteous and kind and loving, that's because of her. Because you've been out laboring in the fields. She is the foundation of the house. That is the help that she gives to you. She compliments you. That while you're out providing and working and bringing home and loving and caring, that she is preparing the home for you. That you have a place. And you also need to know that God does not love your wife any less. And she doesn't think that she's just subordinate to you. Because she is a fellow heir of the inheritance of the kingdom of God. She is the same as you. Now here's the one. Show her honor. Do you respect and value? If you say yes, my next question is do you treat her to where she is, knows that she's respected and honored? Do you seek her counsel or do you seek the counsel of others? I'm telling you, what makes iron sharpen iron in your household so hard is there's no one in this world that knows you better than your wife. No one except God. As you've grown up, not even your mother knows you as well as your wife. And for me in the past, that's been dangerous. I've known Cindy since she was 14 years old. There's nobody in this world that knows me better than her except God. Nobody. And that's a scary, fearful thing. Here's the other one. If you don't care for her honor, it says your prayers will be hindered. Men. Men. If you're not treating your wife right and you're praying and it sounds like things aren't happening, go back to see if you've honored and cared for your wife. Hindered to be or become hindered or prevented in the progress of accomplishment of requests to God. Sometimes, see, I don't understand why God's not hearing my prayer. Maybe the Lord's up there saying, I don't understand why you're not honoring your wife and taking care of your family so that I can hear your prayers because what you're doing is a sin. With this in mind and the center of the dynamics involved in the sanctification sanctification price of the family let's now begin to look at the husbands in general the quote man of the house in Ephesians 5 1 again we are reminded therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us an offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma men husbands our example is Jesus Christ the groom and how he loves his bride, the church. And I want to I shape kind of a motif in this. You remember where I said the garden is where Adam fellowship with God, knew God, had his wife, and they were going great until the sin. They were pushed out of that sanctuary and forbidden to go back in. So now man is in the world. Man is in the world trying to obey the commands to have dominion and multiply. I would tell you husbands that in our day and age your household should be like the Garden of Eden. Your household should be a sanctuary where you can keep the things of the world from invading into your home. They are going to deal with them on the outside in the world. But your home should be a house of prayer. Your home should be a place where your wife knows she's cherished, cared for, and respected, and loved. 
A home is where you will protect, provide for your family. You are preparing them to when they go out into the world of service to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and to love their neighbors as themselves. Our home is a sanctuary. I want you to remember one thing. Adam was thrown out of the garden because he did not protect it from Satan when he filled the serpent. On the other hand, Christ, when he came, went into the tabernacle where his father dwelt and he threw out the money changers. He cleaned the temple out. Why? Because that is a holy place. That is a place where they meet with God. Your home should be a place where you meet with God. If you meet but do not honor God, I'm, if you do not take time to have devotions with your wife, if you do not have time to school your children in the way of the Lord's in your home, you failed as a husband because you're not preparing them to go into the world where the sinners dwell. Your wife will not be covered with the word. Your children will not be raised in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. You will have given in to the way of the world and a home is a place you come to at the end of the day when you're tired and you do what you want to do. When you get up in the morning, devotions, ah, we'll do it later. It's not important, but I'm going to go play golf today. I'm picking on men. I'm a man. I wrestle with these things. But if the garden was a place that I was to grow and learn about the fear of God, the love of God, the mercies of God, the teaching of God, then my home is that sanctuary where I get up and diligently, diligently search scriptures, where I seek God, where I confess my sins, where I pray for my family, because that's all that really matters. That's my number one priority, the Lord my God, to love Him. And if I love Him, guess what? I'll do a good job at work. But I can't let work become my God. Because when work becomes your God, God drops. And when God drops, you're in rebellion. Husbands, what I'm saying is, there is more on our shoulders than you believe. In your home, you are to protect. You are to provide. Not just physical food, spiritual food. And you protect, not just from burglars or somebody breaking in your home but the spiritual burglars that would come in your home and try to take your children let's look at how Christ loved the church let's look at some things first of all Christ loves his church he loved her so much that he died for her that the power that God through the power of the Holy Spirit would woo his elect, his bride to him. He died, he gave his life that he could have a church. He provides for her. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of, well of water springing up to eternal life. We feed physical food, but we feed our family the spiritual food. We teach them that Jesus is the bread of life, that he is the water. We teach them that God loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them. Your children need to know that you love them so much that not only are you willing to die physically for them, but you're willing to die to the pleasures and lusts of this world in order that they would know that you love them and more importantly that they would know that you love God I can tell you that one of the happiest moments of my life uh, my daughter Jamie was 15 at the time and in the assemblies of God you had missionettes you had royal rangers missionettes were women young women that learned scripture it was like a spiritual girl scout and she was coming back to talk to those that were graduating. And they asked her, the pastor asked her, they said, uh, How has your father been a support to you? And if you're a dad, you know you, you tremble at that when you ask your kids what they think. And she said, My dad is convicted to the scriptures. 
she said, I know he loves me because he loves the Lord more. I choke up at that even now. Men, that's what it's about. That's what it's about when your wife can look at you or tell another person. My husband is so strong in his convictions in Scripture that because he loves the Lord more than anything in the world, I know he loves me. And I know he will never do anything to hurt me or to expose me to evil or let evil come into the foundations of my home, which I have established as God has decreed. Man, that, that's what it's about. He protects her. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. For his sheep. As I said, physically, there's not a dad in here that would not stand up and stand in the gap for his wife and his children if they were being threatened. But how much are you willing to die for those things that are not physical, but they're pleasurable to you, and they may be harmful to your family? You see, we studied in Sunday school, God is not partial. Sin is sin. And because you're a believer and you do a little bit, guess what? That's still sin. That's still sin. He also, God also put it in that he saves his wife from herself. If you remember, Matthew read today Numbers 30. It used to be that if a wife said, oh, I, I, I swear to the Lord, I will never do this again. And her husband looks and says, you know what, that's really an unrealistic vow. So I'm not going to hold you to that. I release you from that vow. Why is that important? Because we're judged by every careless word we've uttered. We're judged by the vows that we make. And man, you notice something. That was only for the woman. It wasn't for us. So he protects his wife from herself. And number four, he serves her. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. Men, we're here to serve our wives. When you go out and you work hard to make a living, you're not doing it for you. You're doing it for them, for her. You are serving your wife by providing. That's why when you put the effort and emphasis on what you do, then you lessen for the purpose that is meant to, that is intended. If I'm working because I want to be the greatest worker, I want to be the CEO, I mean, I want people to know who I am. I'm not serving my wife. I'm not serving my family. I'm serving me. But when I look, when the boss gives me a promotion, I just look at it. Honey, God has honored us. Now I can serve you with a little bit more. It's all the motive of the heart. And men, we have become so caught up because of the curse. We are working in the laboring in the, in the fields. We are working and working and working. And we want to, in amidst that, we still want to have dominion. We want to be in charge. God set us to have dominion over the world, and that is our purpose. I'm going to achieve. I'm going to have dominion. Oh, yeah, I'll have kids. But there's no relationship. There's no relationship. You look at the problem today in the world. It's fatherless children. Amen. Single parents. People are procreating. But there's no relationship. There's no responsibility. We should not be like that. We are children of the King. We should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. Husbands, we should to the best of our ability and our family reflect Christ. That our bride would be honored. That our bride would know that she's safe. And as Christ did that, we are responsible for no less. Look at Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is also the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. And as we continue, men, you must... 
Look at what the Bible says about a wife. Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. She is not an albatross. She's not a pain in the side. She's a gift from God. And she is a good gift from God. How do I know? Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. It's good. She is beneficial. She has a purpose in our lives. She's perfect. What does that mean, perfect? She's mature. She's complete. There is nothing lacking in her ability. And the wife that you have, husbands, that's who God planned from the beginning, the foundations of the world. You can't say God is sovereign, but I picked my wife. No, no. If God is sovereign, the woman you're with is the one God intended you to be with. So let me read now Ephesians 5, 23 through 30, and then we'll break this down and I'll close. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does a church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to the wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In these passages we see that like our groom, Jesus Christ, we are to one, love our wives as he loves us in the church. Verse 25, that we are to help her as she goes through her individual process of sanctification, that we may be the means of Christ presenting her to the Father. Verse 26 and 27, and that we are to remember that we are one flesh with our wives. Verses 28 through 31. Verses 25, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. In this verse, we see a command to love our wives just as Christ loved us. Now that word love is agape. It's agape. In scripture, the transcendent agape love is the highest form of love and is contrasted with eros or erotic love and phileo or phileo, brotherly love. Listen to this example. Agape love is about responding calmly when faced with difficulties, sacrificing without complaining, and waiting patiently. This type of love is selfless and is for the preservation of relationships and the development of another person. I want to read that. I want you to write that down. This type of love, agape, is selfless and is for the preservation of relationships and the development of another person. It's not about you. It's about others. One of the things I learn, and I'm learning and I'm still in the process, is making sure I do things not because I want to do them, but because she needs them. You know, what do you mean? I can walk in and hug my wife anytime. That doesn't mean I'm hugging her when she needs it. I've got to walk in and be brave and hug her when she is the most irritated with me that she can be. Because it's not about me. It's about me expressing love and understanding to her. It's about caring for her. It's about dying to self. Putting down self. Christ died once for all. Can I tell you, husbands, you're going to die multitudes of time daily for her. When you put down what you want to do because you know it's better to help. When you sacrifice that special time that you had planned because something came up and you've got friends want to go. And something came up in the home that's there for you to say, I can't go, gentlemen. Not, oh, I'd like to go, but my wife's sick. No, no, I can't go. I have a responsibility. 
It's dying to self. It's dying to self. Number two, we are to help her as she goes through her individual process of sanctification, that we may be the means of Christ presenting her to the Father. When we die as believers in Jesus Christ, you will be presented, you will be presented to God the Father as a trophy. And you know what? Our job as husbands is to prepare, prepare our bride to be trophies. Trophies. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now you would say, well, I can't present her as the church. There's just no way because I'm not God and I, I, I can't do that stuff. So what is an example for us to use that we would say we're presenting our wife to Christ. Let me read it to you. Proverbs 31. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it's still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hand grasps the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are covered with scarlet. She makes covering for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her saying, This is where we come in, gentlemen. Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Gentlemen, that's our goal. Our goal is to help our wives to recognize the foundation of our home, that what she has established while we have been laboring and being the head of our home. We're to build her in the sanctification. And let me tell you, unless you have devotions with your wife, unless you pray with your wife, unless you read for your wife, she will not grow in that fear and admonition of the Lord. There is a reason why you are called a husband, why you are the head. You are to raise up and your, your wife and your children, you are to teach. You are to lead. They need to see you suffer. They need to see you die to self for things you want to do. Gentlemen, the best thing you can do is if you, make a mis if you sin and make a mistake, is to see, have your children see you repent and pray. Let them know that you are not perfect. Also let them know that being macho and tough does not mean you're godly. The Bible tells us, do not be conformed to this world, Romans 12, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Men, that's the first thing we have to know. Christ was more of a man than any of us will ever be. He was kind, he was gentle, he cared for his church. He was not a bully. He was not loud and braggadocious. He was meek. You know what meekness is? Meekness doesn't mean you're weak. Meekness is power under control. Knowing you can do something. 
but restraining yourself from doing it. You don't think Jesus was meek and had power? Anything Jesus would have said to be done would have been done because he was God. But he was meek and he was mild. Doesn't mean he was weak and timid. It means he recognized he had power and authority, but he chose to suppress it for the kindness and the greatness of others. Husbands, that's our job. That's our job. To love the Lord so much that we love our wives more than we love ourselves. We are to remember that we are one flesh with our wives. Do nothing to harm, but rather care and nourish. Give strength and comfort. That's the means by which we help a woman become the Proverbs 31 wife. We nurture, we comfort, we give strength. Verse 31 also reflects the umbilical cord with which parents must be cut off. And so far that they do not control you as a married couple as far as authority and responsibility. In other words, when we got married, we had an understanding, even though we weren't believers, that Cindy was going to protect me from her family and I was going to protect her from my family. We weren't going to let them interfere. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying, young people, the reason you're cleaving is to grow. You can't run home to mom and dad for every problem to be fixed. You grow together. You learn together through trials. That one flesh you're cleaved basically means you are cemented together. You are cemented. That's why God hates divorce. Because the two are one. Do you know in God's eyes, the covenant of marriage... I said covenant, because in the world there is no covenant. There's a contract. Two people cannot be married in a church under the eyes of God if they're unbelievers. They're in contract. That's why when you see a divorce, you see kids being used as assets. Who gets the kids? You get the kid part, you get the kid part. They are not assets, they are human beings. Other the covenant, they are to remain together. But there are three ways, in God's eyes... For divorce, where, where the marriage is dissolved. Number one is death. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she's free to be married to whom she wishes. Caveat, only in the Lord, another believer. So only another believer. Now, we, we've, the second, sexual immorality. The Bible says adultery. I've used sexual immorality, pornea. And the reason I did that were for two reasons. Because sexual immorality is more broad, fornication. But if I say except for adultery, I've already stated number one. In the Old Testament, the penalty for adultery was death. And if they died, they could get married again. So to me, that was kind of repetitive. Okay? Third, an unbeliever. Now, Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16. I'll read it to you and we'll talk about it. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. Now, I'll stop right there. Now, when you have that situation, you have a bigger situation than you think. Because half of you abide by this. The other half does not. If you are a husband and your wife is an unbeliever, you can't tell her the Bible says because she's not a believer. She doesn't care what the Bible says. So as long as you understand that interaction and she may go places you don't want, you can't go. I mean, you see the division. What does light have with darkness, right? When, you, when you're like that and you be, one of you become a believer, and the other does not, you have light and darkness. And as long as the darkness wants to stay with you, then hopefully God will draw them for salvation. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. 
For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. We can get into that later. Without, we don't have time for that. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such case, but God has called us to peace. And here's for those of you that say, I'm going to marry him and he's unsaved, because I can change him. Here's what it says in verse 16. How do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Salvation is not from us, it's from the Lord. So when you say, well, I know he's not saved or she's not saved, but I think if I get married too, I can change him. Listen, there are married couples who are Christians that are still working through being changed. And I think one of the things we'll learn, I can't change Cindy and Cindy can't change me. And when we try, then we butt heads. It has to be God through the Holy Spirit that changes us. So if that's the case, if you're a believer with an unbeliever, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Husbands, we have a responsibility that is so large. I say to a lot of people that if I can see a pastor in a pulpit, I can tell you what his congregation is like because they will reflect the pastor. It's the same in the family. If you see children that are just absolutely out of control, disrespectful, just look at the parents. Look at the parents. You are the head of your home. You are the head of the body in your home. Your body consists of your wife and your children. How you lead will be reflected. So to sum it up, husbands, you're responsible to pray for your wives. You're responsible to teach your wives the thing of the Lord. You are responsible to die of yourself in order that you can accomplish the number one goal, which is to grow in God through Jesus Christ. It's to take the trappings of the world out of the equation. It's to remember that your house is your Eden. It is your sanctuary. You are responsible for it. You are responsible for equipping your children and your wife to go into the area of service. Do they know how to share the gospel? Do they know what the gospel is? Do they, know, do they have convictions? Do they know that they have your support if they stand on those convictions? Are you going to be ashamed of them when they make convictions and, or make a statement regarding what you believe and what you think in front of other adults? And you're maybe ashamed that you don't want to lose a friendship. We have a responsibility, and God will hold us accountable for that responsibility. But it's so great that God is love for us, that He shows us, that He teaches us, that He has grace and compassion to us. And I challenge you men this week. I do. I challenge you. Look at the different times in your family when you have an opportunity to do something, but you know you're needed at home. And you choose to die to self and suffer for the best, for the sake of your family. I ask you also challenge you to keep track for just this week. How many times you have prayer with your wife and you lead her in a devotion. Whether it's reading the Psalms or the Proverbs that you're reading scripture to her. And if you're not, and all of a sudden things seem to be going wrong and your prayers aren't being answered, I would tell you that's because you're not doing your responsibility. But like 1 John 1 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, wash us clean. Men, we have a lot of repenting, we have a lot of praying, but we have a big responsibility. Amen?